have trouble getting through so many songs these days. The profound meaning of such as that last hymn. Uh, you know, I, I guess with, with increased age, I'm getting to be quite a crybaby. Uh, because of the meaning, the profound relationship that we have in Jesus and the magnitude of it all. Uh, you are my treasure, my all in all. And this last song, a quick anecdote, wasn't going to mention this, it didn't even come to mind until we sang it, but 14 years ago now, um, Grant's dad and our, our daughter Tanya's husband died very sudden, suddenly, just at 37 years old. An awful thing, an awful time, it seemed. At the service, at the remembrance service, which was held here, Tanya, our daughter, she had seen to it that that hymn was put in the, the program. And uh, when the first words came up, in Christ alone, Her hand went up. And she has experienced that ever since. She has been made profoundly strong as a widow and uh, just understands. <coughs> and all of us through our own particular journey, come to understand more and more, we hope, that it's in Christ alone that we stand at all. Um, and this will be seen even in today's section in the book of Acts. So forgive me, but I'm, I'm just a crybaby. <laughs> um, now to the order of events, which I've totally forgotten here. I was going to ask... Uh, Russ and Dan, if they would pass out an outline. Uh, if there aren't enough to go around, you maybe can share it with somebody next to you. So Tanya, all these 14 years as a widow has only been growing stronger in Christ alone and been able to handle what has come her way. And hopefully we'll be impressed with that very phenomenon uh, through today's thoughts, that it truly is in Christ alone. So let's pray and then we'll uh, begin the thoughts here. By the way, Jared, thank you for all those pieces. The, the music here has been so, the pieces picked out have been so meaningful over these last few months, very beautiful. Heavenly Father, we, uh, again, are overwhelmed with your grace. Your Son is our all in all. And to him and to you be all glory this morning. We would give all credit where credit is due, all worth where worth is due. And so that is our prayer, that uh, through your word, you will speak this morning to your glory, for your namesake, and for the needs of all of us here, whatever those might be, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Picking up uh, where we left off uh, with John Benson last week, which was an excellent coverage, uh, just on your sheet you'll notice there, um, the uh, Paul went along with some cultural customs because he wanted by all means to be all things to all people without compromise. It's, it, doesn't, it meant no compromising of the truth of the gospel at all, uh, but it was cultural customs. And many missionaries, uh, remember reading the history of Hudson Taylor, missionary to China, who was the first one that thought of, oh yeah, why not dress as the Chinese dress? Why not eat as they eat? Why not live in a place like they live in uh, instead of being European and, and maintaining our culture for really no good reason at all? Because if we live like they live, we're not compromising the truth. We are just assimilating so that uh, we might have a common ground on which to preach Christ. And that's what Paul was doing in the previous chapter um, the, uh, in uh, chapter 26, uh, going and before that as well, uh, doing a culturally wise thing so that you might have common ground, uh, becoming all things to all people in the good sense without compromise. A uh, little personal thing, when we were in the country of Colombia, uh, we also had to assimilate to a certain degree uh, we had to drink matzamorra. You wouldn't want to touch it. It was milky white something or other with brownish something or other floating in it. Uh, but we downed it, and we're still here. Uh, it was really something. And, and uh, a couple of other times, we, we went house to house in a big city for a couple of years, meeting the people in, in our limited Spanish, presenting the gospel to them. And we were often invited in with great hospitality. And uh, in some cases, they even offered us aguardiente, uh, two, a combined word, agua, ardiente. Um, it means water fire or fire water. You can imagine what that was, the highest alcohol proof. That, uh, <laughs> so in, in, in those cases, we declined. Uh, but. Uh, in many, many other cases, we had to culturally assimilate and not offend them, but provide a platform on which we could present the, the, uh, the good news of the gospel to them. So that's what happened in the previous chapter. And now we'll pick it up, and I'm going to ask uh, Jared if he would, there you are. Uh, we're, we're at verse 27 of Acts 21. Uh, as the, the various men read this morning, if you can follow along in your own Bible, that would be a big help. Um, Acts chapter 21, verses 27 to 36. Thank you, Jared. So 
the segue from the previous chapter to this takes us from a mild situation becoming culturally assimilating on the part of Paul, mild to a mob. Uh, and we see how fast it can happen. They were just completing the process of this assimilation, and they were in the temple, and looking at your own uh, text there, some Jews from the province of Asia. Now, in the last few years in the U.S., we've seen more uh, riots than we can imagine, and we've also seen uh, that there are some uh, instigators or plants it seems to be that there have been some plants to just instigate the crowd to get going. Um, and over, over and over again through the book of Acts, we have seen this, uh, mob scenes, and so it, it, in, in the province of Asia at least, once Paul had preached in a certain city, the plants stirred up the crowd and he was driven out of that city, sometimes beaten almost to the point of death and he went to another city, but a core group of planters followed him to that city, and it happened again, and then again, and again, and again. Uh, and this is, again, now he's, he's back in Jerusalem right now. And by the way, we have, this may be one of the last times you see the Eastern Mediterranean before we finish the book of Acts. But we need to understand, in all of the operation of the universe, and in particular to this planet, there is an epicenter. The epicenter is Jerusalem. No other city has, such, has had such intrigue. Jerusalem has changed hands with conquerors uh, more than 50 times throughout its history. Uh, and that is the focal point for all of God's operation. Now, of course, he operates all over the planet, but the epicenter is Jerusalem. And we're, we've come back to that now after Paul's journeys over to Asia Minor, which we liken to Turkey now, and under, over to Greece, as far as Greece. He has now come back to Jerusalem against the advice of many Christians because there was a special animosity toward him at Jerusalem. So keep your eye on the map as we go along, but most of it right now is happening right down, uh, let's see if I can, yeah, right down at the bottom there, Jerusalem of Judea. So riot plants seem to follow him from city to city, stirring up the people against what they considered a cult or a new unacceptable sect. And they stirred up irrational, rabid, and we've, you know, this is, we can kind of relate to this now in our current world. It becomes like rabid, like a rabid dog, the mob violence. But it was also reminiscent of Stephen and Jesus. We can recall earlier in Acts what happened to Stephen and how at that point, Paul was one of the rabid people in his zeal for the Judea, uh, for Judaism, one of the rabid people that was uh, egging on the mob and holding their uh, outer cloaks so they could throw stones at Stephen. Um, and then it's also reminiscent of Jesus, and we're going to see a little more of that in just a moment. But in this case, Paul is the victim. He's not the persecutor, he's the persecuted. At one point, when Paul was converted from Saul to Paul, Paul uh, the Lord gave him that, the new name of Paul, uh, the Lord said to Ananias in Damascus, uh, bringing Paul along after his conversion to Christianity, he said, the Lord said, I will show Paul how much things he will suffer. Um, we often think of the old saying, we'll, we'll reap what we sow. And in a very real sense, this happened to Paul. It was, it was quite a turnabout. He had been the persecutor of the Christians, and now as a Christian, he's persecuted. But let's look at a couple things. Look down at verse uh, 
29. And with the mob violence, there always is evil speaking and the wrong use of the tongue. And falsehood can just drown out truth. So it says here uh, that the mob these instigators were saying, men of Israel, help us. This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against our people. So they're bringing up the thought, this is uh, anti-Semitism against our people. You know, the Gentiles are against us enough without this guy uh, getting them more against us and our law in this place. So he, they were appealing to the crowd this is an anti-Jew guy, and he's, he's causing trouble all over the world. Let's get rid of him. Against our people and our law in this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks or Gentiles into the temple area and thus defiled this holy place. And then in parentheses, probably in your Bible too, they based this whole thing on, they had previously seen Trophimus, a friend of Paul's, Trophimus the Ephesian, a Gentile, in the city with Paul, and they assumed, they assumed Paul had brought him into the temple area. Wow. Uh, that real good evidence? No. So the accusation was on a presumption uh, about Trophimus, that Paul had actually brought him illegally into the temple. And that was... Uh, tantamount to execution of any Gentile that would be found in the temple. It was, that was the hugest no-no. Reading on, the whole city was aroused and it was so out of, they were started meeting call, they, Paul, they uh, were trying to kill him and the beating had already started, but the fortress of Antonia the local garrison of the Romans was right there in the northwest corner of the Temple Mount, what we call Mount Moriah in Jerusalem, right there now today. Uh, the Temple Mount is a high raised area with quite a quite a acreage to it. And on the northwest side of that was the Roman garrison, the fortress of Antonia, only about two flights of steps down to where this riot was taking place around the temple. So uh, the word got up to the commander pretty quickly and he brought, uh, there were 500 soldiers garrisoned there and he brought whatever number down to quell this uh, sudden riot. So first of all, they put two chains on, on Paul um, and it's reminiscent of in the previous chapter from what John Benson read last week. In that previous chapter, Agabus, a prophet of God, had warned Paul. He actually took Paul's belt and tied Paul's hands and tied Paul's feet. Uh, he warned Paul, don't go up to Jerusalem for this type of thing is going to happen to you. Paul nevertheless went up. And this type of thing did happen. He was doubly bound in some way, some fashion. Um, and so the prophecy almost immediately took place within a few days probably. Now, on your uh, outline sheet, you'll notice a way with him. On the internet, I found a, a commentary by a pastor named David Guzik who listed the, the number of ways that the situation with Paul right here paralleled the situation with Jesus in his accusation the night before he was crucified. Uh, and there were, I looked down at the time, there were 10 or 12 ways. Maybe you can find it back on the internet. <laughs> I got it once and that's about it for me. I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't bring it up again. And I really wanted to have that listed for you, but you see the blanks. Um, however, if you can find that, I recommend it. 
David Guzik, G-U-Z-I-K, uh, listing the parallels to the false uh, trumped up charges against Paul and the way the mob came up and, and all this sorts of false accusations, 10 or 12 different ways that it parallels exactly what happened to our Lord earlier. And uh, what Jared read, what the last, last three words you read were? Away with him. Heard that before? Yeah, Luke 23, 18. When Jesus was crucified and Pilate was seeking to have him released, but the, the planters again, the instigators, stirred up the people and they just said, away with him. We will not have this man to rule over us. Away with him. So there's one of the parallels and a very strong one, the last words of that section. Now I'm going to ask Grant to read the next section, uh, uh, verses 37 to 40. Thank you. So, uh, you got to visualize this a little bit. Paul was already beaten up. He was already beaten up. But now the mob goes from mob to mum. Mum's the word, except for the words that Paul's going to say. All of a sudden, they must have heard him because there was such a disorder, but they must, the crowd must have heard him all of a sudden speaking Greek to the uh, Roman commander and asking the Roman commander very, very calmly and politely, you know, here's this man beaten up. They had tried to kill him. Uh, and he basically just asked, may I say something to you? And then may I speak to the people? And so, the commander uh, gave him the permission to do that. And when he did, he switched to Aramaic or Hebrew. Okay. Bilingual Paul. Um, they, a lot of the crowd might have thought this guy was just a nothing, a rabble rouser and so on. And we know from all of scripture that Paul was a highly educated person and you know, completely bilingual here. And so, wow, the crowd all of a sudden, they heard Greek, which was all Greek to them. And, uh, and all of a sudden, now they hear Aramaic. Okay, wow, this guy's no dummy. Um, and that, plus the fact that the commander was there with his soldiers, finally restored some order. And we see in... Um, We see already that he's saying that he is a Jew. And the commander had recently had in his experience and his knowledge a, a or an insurrectionist, an insurrectionist, a rebel out of Egypt who had collected some 4,000 murderers to try to cause, go against the Roman Empire and so on. And he said, aren't you that one? And Paul, in verse 39, says, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia. Now, Paul's hometown, if you can read it up there, is in the purple Cilicia and Tarsus, but he was born a Jew. Um, and this got the commander's attention, and the commander said, okay, you may speak to the people. All right, in Aramaic, Brian, would you, I'm sorry, Josh, Josh Mantegna, would you uh, do verses 1 through 5 in chapter 22?
Thank you. So Paul finds some common ground here. As if you, get, you know, the, the crowd got, <laughs> uh, what is it with mobs? I don't know. But they got completely silent for a bit and uh, for quite a bit here. We're not going to cover it all. But he said, I was born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but his uh, education in all of Judaism was under Gamaliel, one of the most well-known uh, rabbis. And it was in Jerusalem. So again, uh, that's where he spent a lot of his youth uh, in getting educated in Judaism. And he finds common ground even with, he, he starts and says, uh, brothers and fathers. He was showing them respect. Even these people that just, you know, beat them to a pulp. He's showing them respect. Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. And then further on down, he said, I was thoroughly trained in the law of our fathers and was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. Paul was sincere, even when he was uh, going along with Stephen's death and promoting it. Paul was sincere. And many of the Jews here were sincere. They were sincerely wrong. Um, but he makes that common ground, you know. I thought the same as you thought, fathers and brothers in a very uh, congenial sense, in a common ground. I thought the same as you thought. And then he goes on to make his defense, or his defense. And that's as much as we'll cover from there because what goes on uh, until verse... Um, Actually, I'm going to have Brian read now, and then we'll go on from there. Brian, would you, uh, verses now, this is from being mum back to a mob. So. Just as in the section that Jared read, we had the last three words being the strongest, away with him. What do you think uh, the, uh, the crowd went from silent listeners from mum to mob? What one word set them off? Gentiles. 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 They could not stomach that, that the rest of the world could be brought into relationship with God, same as they were. Um, it really set them off. This is when they went, went nutso again and became rabid. 
Now, all that uh, Brian read was about the fourth time, and I think there's another time coming yet in the book of Acts, where Paul gives his testimony, his conversion testimony, uh, because many people needed to hear it, um, like where he's coming from. You know, and the Jews, the Jews that still were steeped in Orthodox Judaism just couldn't grasp it at all. Like, where are you coming from? Um, and so he gave his testimony several times through the book of Acts as a platform, and he was given a platform twice in these two chapters by the Roman commander to speak. And here he is, beaten up, probably sore, aching. And what did he do? Instead of saying, help, help, he saw it as a platform from which to speak to many people the good news of Jesus Christ and the way, the truth, and the life. How to be saved through Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. So he used it as a platform. Now, for just a moment, visualize this scene. They're going back from mum to mob. So when they hear the word Gentiles, that's too much for them. That's too much. And they, they take off their outer coat. And you've got these cloaks and this dust flying all over the place. And total disorder again that the Roman commander uh, would have to quell in order to save Paul's life and restore order in Jerusalem. So a weird thing about justice system under the Romans and even under the English later on and many peoples, not just them, but many, coercion of confession through torture. In the Middle Ages, the British used to do this by the rack. Uh, if they wanted to get a confession out of somebody, whether it was real or made up, they just stretched them on the rack and tortured them until they couldn't stand it. And they said, I'll, I'll confess to anything, even if they weren't guilty, even if it wasn't true. And this is the type of thing that the Romans did by flogging with that thing called the fl uh, flagellum, uh, a terrible scourge instrument that was used on our Lord as well, to coerce a confession. So before there's even a trial, before there's even any justice done, that's one of the first things they do, is they flog, no, you know, no going to trial, no due course, just a flogging to try to get a confession out of Paul. And uh, they were about to do that. So, uh, that's a little further on. Let's read together verse 23 that paragraph, as they were shouting, here they are in, in uh, mob form again, as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the commander ordered Paul to be taken into the barracks. He directed that Paul be flogged or scourged and questioned. So you get, you get beat to the point you can't stand it anymore, then you'll confess to anything. Flogged and scourged, questioned in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. But a centurion, a lesser rank soldier was right there. And he, he said, is it legal? He said to the commander, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? Then uh, the, he said to the commander, what are you going to do? This man is a Roman citizen. Uh, and the commander again said, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. The commander said, I had to pay a, pay a big price for my citizenship. And the idea was there was most likely it was bribery, uh, pay off the officials to get citizenship. And then Paul said, but I was born a citizen, free, free citizenship. I was born a citizen. Those who were about to question withdrew immediately, so the flogging did not take place. Now the Romans themselves were concerned and even a bit scared, we better not do this to a Roman citizen. And so 
uh, Paul escaped the flogging in that case. He had been beaten many, many other times in other cities, but not this one. The last couple verses, he's about to go before the ruling body of the Jews. He's about to go before the Sanhedrin for a last defense, another testimony of his conversion and a defense of the gospel. So in verse 30, we'll finish it up here right to the end of the chapter. The next day, since the commander waited to find out exactly why Paul was being accused by the Jews, he released him and ordered the chief priests and all the Sanhedrin, the governing body, the government of, of Israel, of Judea, Judea and Jerusalem. He ordered them to assemble. Then he brought Paul and had him stand before him. And that's where we'll leave off today. And um, next week, Ernie Lehman will pick it up from there. But going through this book of Acts makes you realize a lot of things. Um, irrationality and falsehood and false accusations and lies took over many, many different times, many different occasions uh, throughout this book of Acts. Beatings and fleeings from various cities to other cities, but the instigators followed him around as well. Um, and there were mobs, some of whom were of rabid zeal or rabid evil. And there were both types in some of these mobs. And the second thing to take, I'm going to read Romans 11, 7, 8 on that. And then uh, let's do that now. Turn to Romans 11, verses 7 and 8. Or stay where you are. That'll be fine, too. Oh, wait a minute. Romans comes after Acts, right? Thank you very much. So the ones that were rioting out of zeal were sincere. Sincerely wrong. Romans 11, verse 7 uh, God talking about his, how he operates with Israel and how Israel is thinking and this sort of thing. What then? What Israel sought so earnestly, or even like sincerely, it did not obtain. But the elect, the chosen of God, did. The others, their heart was hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor or sleepy blindness, eyes that they could not see and ears that they could not hear to this very day. And we know that until God's Holy Spirit showed the light of the world to us individually, we had blindness as well. We couldn't see that Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life. And the, the vast majority of folks in the world that have not yet become believers, that's what the case is. Uh, not just the Jewish uh, Orthodox Judaism, who were earnest in their zeal, sincere but sincerely wrong, but the only ones that have been able to see are the ones to whom God has taken the scales off our eyes and uh, replaced the blindness with the light, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And the other takeaway, so we can see how either in a, in a secular state of mind, secular state of mind, or in a religious state of mind, people can become rabid in their zeal because they think their way is the way. Jesus said, I am the way. And this is part and parcel of God must initiate all things. Uh, when we came to Christ, um, well, the Bible says he first loved us. When we came to Christ, did we say, aha, I loved you first? No. No, we didn't do that. Um, because we recognized that we were sinners. 
And as such, we did not love him first. He first loved us. And why must God initiate all things? So that Lucifer-type pride could never enter heaven, so that heaven could remain heaven. Because if we took an iota of pride into heaven with us, hmm, not so perfect anymore, right? So all boasting had to be eliminated. God must initiate all things, uh, even in salvation, even to a person becoming a believer. And he even imparts the faith to believe in Jesus Christ. And uh, so I would turn your attention, not now, but sometime to uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, or 8 through 10 actually, but mainly 8 and 9, which explains that very well, that God must give us even the faith to believe and he, he's got to be the initiator of all things. Let's pray. To you be the glory, Lord. Your thoughts are so much higher than our thoughts and your ways so much higher than our ways. To you be the glory, O omnipotent one, omniscient one, and all loving one. You are love. And uh, we just thank you for yourself. And thank you for these thoughts. We pray that those that should stay with us will stay with us and erase anything that was not of you. And so we uh, commit this to you. And we give thanks now for the bonus meal and uh, ask your blessing upon it. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>